And the kind of things that people are investigating are using these hierarchies of abstraction where you've got basic DNAs, which form, can be used to encode different functions which are involved in uh, the elaboration of genomes, for example, which can elaborate uh, particular uh, devices or circuits, which could then be built into systems. And that each of the components within these hierarchical networks can be worked on by um, um, he or she engineer, and then can be passed to another person, and they're modular and exchangeable. And so this broadly illustrates the kind of processes that people are starting to explore now, where engineering principles are being directly drawn into biology to allow construction. And that the kind of, the, the kind of applications that people are exploring are very broad, because essentially any living system uh, can be potentially modified in some fashion using these kind of technologies. And of course, this is not a new issue. This is something that has started since 1972, which is when the first uh, recombinant DNA experiments were done. But the kind of applications that are being explored, and these are being actively explored across the world, uh, the uh, modification of feedstocks to re replace petrochemicals, either to produce plastics or fuels, for example, uh, to provide renewable energy sources, and of course, bioproduction of many of the the kinds of uh, chemicals and uh, scents and uh, pharmaceuticals, many of which already still come from natural sources, but which can now be modified uh, in a living system to improve or modify their, their properties. And of course, biological catalysts for industry, smart medicines, and the issues of bioremediation and conservation. So I'll finish there and hand over directly to Ben, perhaps, or... Give you a round of applause if they were feeling generous. <laughs> So thank you. I know what you're thinking. Bio bricks, they sound a lot more fun even than stickle bricks. But we'll, we'll come back to that later. Now, you may have points or questions immediately for that. Hold them until after we've also heard from, from Ben as well, and then we'll kind of get back to the basics as well. Uh, now, Ben Davis is Professor of Chemistry at Oxford. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is design, if designer life is going to be something big in Scotland, why have we got one from Oxford and one from Cambridge? That might also be a legitimate question to ask later. Uh, ben is one of the world's leading experts on synthetic biology. Uh, Technology Review recently named him as in the top 100 young innovators on the planet. He and his research group, that's not to be confused with the Ben Davis group nominated for a Mercury Music Prize in 2007, uh, have won all sorts of awards for their work, a lot of which involves molecular engineering of one form or another. And uh, I also noticed, Ben, you're advertising for two jobs as personal assistant and research technician at the moment. I don't know if that's because he's got a high turnover rate or he's really difficult to work with. But please welcome Professor Ben Davis. Thank you very much, Quinton. I think the answer is probably both. <laughs> so um, uh, you've had a, a wonderful introduction from Jim as to uh, some of the ways that people are thinking about reprogramming biology and perhaps one day reprogramming life. And I'm going to give you very much a chemist's perspective on how we're thinking about trying to not only reprogram biology, but the building blocks that you heard uh, Jim talk about. And what I've shown here in my first slide is, is sort of, in a way, how chemists view life. This is a representation of two different molecules, two different structures in biology interacting, one of which is an example of something that we, in, in, in my group, we've, we've looked at trying to create a synthetic variant of. These are two different molecules. These are two different proteins. And you've heard wonderfully from Jim how DNA can be manipulated to take biology into a form of engineering. We look at it from a very different perspective, trying to use chemistry to manipulate not just DNA, but some of the other building blocks that we find in life. There are so many wonderful building blocks. And I'm going to give you an example today of, of manipulating proteins to make synthetic proteins that we hope one day might be useful in diagnosing disease and perhaps one day treating disease. So one of the potential outcomes from synthetic biology, and, and in a sense that's one of the questions we're, we're going to consider tonight, uh, is that it might be able to produce something that could be akin to the pharmaceutical industry, a new form of drug discovery. And several people have drawn parallels between the way that the pharmaceutical industry started at the beginning of the 20th century with the way that synthetic biology might develop. It's sort of remarkable to look back at the development of the drug industry. The start of the 1900s, Emil Fischer won the Nobel Prize for proving the structure of glucose, one of the most fundamental molecules in life in chemistry. We didn't really know what the structure was. And so we started with discovery of natural products of small molecules like glucose. 
we got to a point where people like Fisher could start to make glucose and variants of glucose. And then from that point on, from the 20s and the 30s, ingenuity in this country, in Germany, in the US, led to the discovery of drugs by almost a bucket load. We take it as read today that there will probably be a drug out there or a drug being developed that might treat a disease that we're interested in. So in the space of 100 years, we went from nothing, from hardly knowing what glucose was, to drugs all around us. We and many other people think the potential in synthetic biology might be very much the same. We've spent the last 20, 30 years doing a wonderful job of characterizing the biomolecules, the molecules of life, the protein, the DNA molecules, the nucleic acids, the other types of molecules, and trying to understand what they do. And we think that now might be the time to start to build not only the types of molecules that we find in life, but other variants, variants that perhaps we could design to perform a function that they don't yet perform, perhaps to diagnose disease or to be used in treatment. So just to give you some examples, to draw some parallels, I've shown here two molecules that are extracted from willow bark, perhaps the most famous molecules on the planet. This is salicylic acid, and this is something that's referred to as oil of wintergreen. Since the time of Hippocrates, we've known that we can take willow bark and use it to treat, for example, fever, to treat the symptoms of pain. 250 years ago, uh, a vicar in, the, in, the, in Chipping Norton in Oxfordshire was the first to really document the use of salicylic acid, what he called salix, from the name from the willow plant. Over the years, this has led to remarkable discoveries, to, as is often the case, a UK discovery was, was taken forward in particular by the Bayer Company in Germany, the development of aspirin, named again after the German for salicylic acid. And aspirin is probably the most widely used compound on the planet and has been used for 100, almost 100 years, over 100 years for treatment of diseases in a wide variety of states. So by understanding what these small molecules do, we were able to develop unnatural analogues. Aspirin isn't natural, but it's wonderfully powerful as a tool for treating disease and symptoms of disease. And so the methodology that has helped us do this, the underpinning industry, has developed around making salicylic acid and making aspirins. And discoveries, for example, on the role of these natural products has allowed us to create new variants, something that almost certainly most of you in this room will have taken, Nurofen, ibuprofen, another uh, UK discovery from the 1960s. So over thousands of years, hundreds of years, developments in synthetic chemistry have allowed us to create new tools for making, frankly, life better. So we can imagine perhaps the same type of thing taking place in synthetic biology. We're at the stage now where we can take things like this. This is a white blood cell. And I've shown here a little cartoon of a protein that we're interested in that's found on the surface of white blood cells. By trying to understand the function of this protein, and in particular the molecular fingers that decorate that, that protein, we can diagnose the parts and dissect their function, and then perhaps create synthetic variants that might be able to allow us to, to see the sites of disease. And I'll give you some more details of that in a second. So one of the questions you may be asking is, why do we want to make a synthetic biology? What's wrong with the biology that we have? And this is perhaps summarized in this wonderful triangular diagram that is at the heart of all molecular biology. This is something that Francis Crick called the central dogma of molecular biology. It's so important. Um, so Francis Crick pointed out of the three major classes of biomolecules, DNA, RNA, and protein, it's possible for those biomolecules to exchange information in all sorts of different ways. They're wonderfully powerful. But what actually happens in biology is, as you heard from Jim, that really information is passed from our genetic code, from DNA, via RNA molecules to proteins. And so that means that typically the process of biology is taking information from here through to here. 